faculty governance. Uh, for those of my faculty colleagues and faculty senate colleagues who are in the room, I'm sorry if a few of the things I say are very familiar and simplistic to you. Um, but I really, I really want to talk to the students, and I think it's great to see so many students here, and I really applaud the organizers. Um, I want to pick up on, just to begin, a couple things the last couple of speakers have said uh, that I think are very important, and I guess if there's a, a key word to my talk that I want you to take away today, that term is, is democracy. Um, if you got to hear Steve Hayes' opening remarks up, upstairs a few hours ago, he talked about the university having lost a sense of its purpose. Uh, and I think one of the things we need to do is to, to recenter and to refocus. And I'd like to suggest that, just as a kind of proposal, this isn't original to me, this is very 60s of me, um, but that, that, that we think about the university as a place to educate citizens for participation in a democracy. Uh, so, you know, we hear a lot about learning outside of the classroom and the student experience, and that's all very important. Uh, one of the things I think is very important for us as faculty to do for students is to model for you what democratic participation is in, 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 in the life of the community. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, the other thing I want to say, picking up on uh, that theme and what the last couple of speakers have said, as you go away today as, as students, I really want you to stay focused on the following simple message. This is your university, all right? It's mine too, but it's yours too. Uh, and with that comes certainly a set of rights to be able to speak out and shape it. But the other thing that comes with that is, is a responsibility. Um, to get involved, to be active, to try to shape the course of the institution. Uh, and you can do that in two broad ways, both outside of official systems and within official systems. And, and I really hope, uh, I, I don't know a lot of the students uh, involved in the Student Senate here, um, but if you get charged up today, think about running for, for, for Student Senate. Um, don't write it off if it's something that you've written off in the past. Um, because believe me, while they don't always listen to the Senates in, in Cutler Hall, the Senates are a lot harder for them to ignore um, than, than, than lone voices or even other kinds of, of groups that might work outside of that, outside of that structure. Um, okay, so for, for students, if you don't know this, at Ohio University we have five different uh, senates, uh, one for the faculty, one for the undergraduate students, one for the graduate students, one for our administrative employees, and one for uh, the classified employees. And those senates uh, meet regularly, some meet monthly, some meet more often. Uh, and the leaders of those groups have uh, a fair amount of interaction with the upper administration, with the president, with the provost, with Vice President for, for Finance. Um, and people who are in leadership positions uh, in groups like that, like myself, uh, get put on a lot of committees. Um, now, I spend an awful lot of time in places like that, and I don't think I'm wasting my time doing that. Um, but I will, you know, in case people don't know how things work around here, we have at Ohio University, uh, especially at the top, what I would call the input model. Um, input is a word that one hears a lot from President McDavis whenever he's asked about this issue of shared governance. Um, he listens a lot. He listens to different groups, um, and, and then he makes up his mind. Uh, even Budget Planning Council, which is a group that I've been involved in for five years, uh, is a recommending body to, to, to the president. I, I know there's been a a controversy on campus, particularly among students, about getting access to those meetings. And I, I think some important things do go on there. But decisions about the campus are not being made there. Recommendations are being made there. And I think that's a, a, a crucial distinction. Decision-making bodies versus, versus recommending bodies. All right, just, just a few words. Again, this is for the students on, on our faculty senate. Uh, Faculty Senate is made up, uh, as of last Friday, of, of 51 members. We have representatives proportionally uh, from all of the different colleges, uh, at least one representative from each of our regional campuses, uh, and also representatives, this would include the College of Medicine, 
and, and now the Voinovich School. Um, we are uh, organized as a Senate. Uh, we meet monthly as a full body, but four committees. And I just want to tell you briefly about our committees so you get a sense of what some of the main areas are that we're concerned about. Uh, one committee is called Finance and Facilities that works on, on budgetary <coughs> issues. Uh, I think that's very important. Another is called the Educational Policy and Student Affairs Committee. That committee overlaps with our University Curriculum Council, which makes all kinds of decisions about new courses, course requirements, uh, uh, major requirements, programs, things of that sort. Um, we also have a promotion and tenure committee that sets rules in the university for our procedures of tenuring faculty and promoting faculty. Uh, they also get involved uh, when um, cases uh, go against faculty in a kind of appeals process. And then we also have a committee uh, called the Professional Relations Committee that deals with issues such as ethics grievances that sometimes faculty have against their deans or against each other. Uh, also issues, uh, a whole range of issues, including things like intellectual property, um, who owns a syllabus in a class, uh, or when a faculty member goes and develops an online course, is that something that belongs to the faculty member or to the university? Um, those are the kinds of issues that get worked out in that committee. Um, what kinds of things do your faculty still have some control and decision making over? Uh, at the university. Um, one of them is, is this, the, the faculty handbook, uh, which has a lot of our procedures about uh, the promotion and tenure process, uh, about different kinds of, of structures in the universities, about how one goes appealing the decisions of one's superiors. Um, we also, uh, this is sort of enshrined in the faculty handbook, and uh, it's, it's still working to a degree. The faculty, there's a sense that the faculty own the curriculum. Um, so it's up to the faculty to create new courses, to eliminate old courses, uh, to devise new programs, uh, to put programs out of business. Um, I don't know if students know this, but uh, administrators in Cutler Hall or deans cannot decide that, say, the English major isn't going to require Shakespeare anymore, or that some uh, uh, music major is only going to require, you know, three hours of, of performance, or, or something along those lines. The faculty control the curriculum of the university. And there's, there are procedures in the faculty handbook for how one might go about, and this is something, unfortunately, we have to worry about in these difficult times, how one might go about eliminating a program. Um, at the moment, uh, again, upper administrators cannot decide that program X is unprofitable and eliminate it. Um, and, and this is, I, I think, one of the things that's really uppermost on the minds of Faculty Senate is to preserve that, that kind of right, uh, that we make decisions around here for curricular region, reasons and for educational reasons, uh, not in ignorance of, of money reasons, um, but that we're not designing our university in terms of uh, profit centers and shutting units down when they don't make their particular quotas uh, in any in any short term kind of period. Uh, I don't want to say a lot about promotion and tenure. I think some speakers later on are going are, are to be talking about that. Um, but that's, that's something very important. Students, you want faculty who are tenured, that have the freedom to design their own curriculum, to design their own courses. And you certainly want faculty who are engaged in research. And why is that important? Why are you getting a better education because your faculty are involved in research? Among, there's the whole issue of, of, of expertise, which I think seems obvious. But the other thing you need to think about is your faculty are people who are involved in the creation of knowledge. And they see education as involving you in the creation of knowledge as well. I have a lot more fun coming to work every day because I know I'm involved in creating knowledge, and I'm not just going there 
to deliver some prepackaged content to you that someone else has, has, has thought up. Okay? That kind of educational system turns a faculty member into a cog in the machine. Uh, and then uh, if you think that morale around here is tanking, stick around when that kind of education comes, comes, comes into place. All right. Um, I guess what I want to do very quickly, just to, to keep you aware of some things that are very much on our minds in, in faculty senate, and that I think are important uh, to, to all students. Uh, one is we are seeing nationally and indeed on our own campus an erosion of this, of this tenure system. Uh, and, and tenure is, is crucial to educational quality, to academic quality, to having a good university. Uh, in Utah last month, there was a legislator who introduced a bill in, in their state legislature uh, that would outlaw tenure at public universities in, in, in Utah. Uh, I believe it's in Louisiana where they're looking at, in a top-down kind of way, eliminating various academic programs around the state. Uh, they're looking at being able to fire people with tenure if they're in an academic unit where uh, they believe the cost is no longer justified. Um, what I worry about more than these kinds of direct and overt attacks on tenure that we see in some of these other states is an erosion in tenure over time. What you've seen at Ohio University and just about every institution of, of uh, public education over the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years is an increasing reliance on non-tenured faculty. Um, these are people who teach a lot of your classes. They're great teachers and, and, and they're dedicated, uh, but they don't have that lifelong uh, commitment in many cases to, to the institution that a tenured faculty member might have. Uh, and, and, and so I think what you're going to see in places like Ohio is not a sort of outright dismantling of tenure. What you're going to see is universities, for some of the corporate reasons that Judith was talking about a few minutes ago, hiring fewer and fewer tenure track faculty, hiring more contingent faculty, and waking up one day and discovering, gee, there aren't these, that many of these tenured folks around. We don't really have to listen to them anymore. Um, and that's dangerous, and it's not something that's going to happen in any kind of catastrophic moment kind of way, but it's going to be, well, it is an erosion that's happening over time.